Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, good to see everybody once again, and uh, you can be turning with me to Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to pick right up where we left off in verse 3. And uh, I don't know how much longer we're going to be in it, but uh, we're going to pick as much out of it as we possibly can. Because after all, that's what makes Bible study, I think, interesting. You just see how much you can dig out. Now, I don't know how many of you know the, uh, the operation of the Jewish yeshivas and the rabbis, and uh, all up through their history, you see, they will sit and maybe spend days, maybe even weeks, I don't know, but all they do is just contemplate on one verse. And uh, maybe they've got all the commentaries of other rabbis, and they know what everyone else has said, but they're going to look at that verse, and they're going to study it, and see what other meaning they can pull out of it. Well, I'm not going to go to that extreme, but uh, I do, do love to just see how much can you pull out of a particular statement in Scripture by comparing it with other Scriptures. That's the name of the game, you know, building Scripture on Scripture. So we'll be staying in uh, chapter 2, verse 3 yet for at least this half hour, maybe even the next one, I don't know. But anyhow, for those of you joining us on television, we like to welcome you. Again, we like to thank you for your letters, your financial help, and I guess most of all for your prayers. My, how we love your letters when you write that you're praying for us every day. Some of you say you pray for us two, three times a day. Well, that's what we need because we know that uh, the devil is quite the adversary. He's powerful, and yet we do feel that the prayers of the saints are more powerful. Okay, I think that's all we need for opening comment. Let's get into the book, chapter 2 of Hebrews, and once again we're going to look at verse 3. The last half hour we looked at the first three or four words. How shall we escape? Now we're going to move on. How shall we escape? That is the wrath and the doom and the eternal lostness if we neglect so great a salvation. Now that word neglect, I think we all experience it. I know I, I've tried to tell, uh, tell my sons in our ranching business, you know, you can't, you can't get careless. You can't cut corners and say, oh well, we'll do it next week or we'll do it tomorrow because just as sure as you do, it's going to hit you in the pocketbook. And so neglect, you see, is, is a word that catches us almost every day of our lives, regardless of what our lifestyle is. Neglect leads to carelessness. All right, and it means the same thing here. In fact, as I was mulling over these things last night, I hadn't even had a time to share it with Iris, but quite a few years ago now, I think it was back in the early 80s, we were driving across New Mexico, and I'm sure some of you have been on that same road. It's just a state highway, it's not an interstate, and you're just driving along on a flat tabletop plateau, and all of a sudden you come to the Rio Grande River, which is just a gorge. Just way, way down is that little Rio Grande River, and of course the bridge goes right on over. And so you come down with just a very gentle incline and then cross the bridge. Well, they had a walkway on the bridge, and uh, so we got on the other side and thought, boy, this is unique. I mean, it's just unreal. Tabletop flat, and straight down is the Rio Grande River. And so when we got on the other side, we pulled off the side and parked, and there were maybe a couple other couples on the bridge. And we went back, and they were looking, and way down there was a beautiful, smashed up and ruined motorhome. And so they were all discussing it, and we said, well, what in the world happened? Well, the couple who owned the motorhome had pulled off on the shoulder on the east side of the bridge, got out, came down on the bridge where we were, and they neglected to set the brake or put it in gear. And all they, while they were on the bridge, that motorhome started rolling, and just almost, they said, as if somebody steered it, just before it got to the bridge, there were no guardrails or everything, over it went, down into the bottom of that gorge and totally destroyed. Well, what prompted it? Neglect. 
just a moment of neglect. And you see, isn't that exactly what people are doing with their eternal doom? They're neglecting the most important thing in life and that is to accept God's offer of salvation and escape that eternal doom. All right, now with that as a backdrop then, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It isn't that it isn't there. You know, I, I mention it so often that in John chapter 10, the, the chapter on the Good Shepherd, where is the door of the sheepfold? Ground level not up on some high cliff, not across some raging river. It's right on ground level. And it's in front of every lost person throughout their life. All they have to do is step in by faith. But they neglect to do it. All right, now let's just use a couple of scripture verses to, to point that out. Uh, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? All right, and we're going to stop there and come back to Matthew 22, where the same Greek word in a little bit different form, but nevertheless it's the same, same Greek root word. Here in Matthew chapter 22, Matthew 22, yeah, verse 5. I was looking right at it and not seeing it. Matthew 22, verse 5. But in order to get the real meaning of the verse, I guess we should go to the beginning of the parable because this again is the Lord Jesus speaking during his earthly ministry. And uh, remember these parables again were directed primarily to the Jewish people, the Pharisees in particular. In fact, while you're in chapter 22, just go back up to chapter 21, verse 45, because I would like to use this verse to explain to people what I mean when I said that everything Jesus said was said to the Jews under the law. All right, you got Matthew 21, verse 45 first. Matthew 21, verse 45. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived or understood that he spake of them. See how plain that is? They understood that all his parables were directed to them because they were the ones that were so guilty. All right, now you come into chapter 22. He gives another parable. And verse 1, Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables. So who do you suppose he's directing it to? Well, the chief priests and the Pharisees. And so he said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king who made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them who are bidden or invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready come to the marriage, but they made light of it. They what? They neglected it. They didn't pay any attention. They neglected their invitation to the wedding feast. All right, and so what was their response? In their neglecting it, they went their separate ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and so forth. But instead of responding to the invitation, they did what? They neglected. See? They neglected paying any attention to that invitation to the marriage feast. All right, now then I think I've got another one in chapter 23. I hope that's the one I want. Yeah, chapter 23. Here's the Lord Jesus, and you've all seen pictures of it on somebody's wall where he is looking out over Jerusalem. And uh, it is a thought-provoking picture, no doubt about it. But this is what he's saying. Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, thou that stonest them who are sent unto thee, how often 
would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings. And what are the next words? And you would not. Why not? They neglected. They didn't pay any mind. And so he's making reference, of course, to the whole Old Testament economy when the prophets were constantly warning Israel of their uh, chastisement, how that other nations would overrun them. And then he says, you would not. Consequently, because of their neglect, what was the, re what was the uh, answer? Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Oh, what an awful condemnation. But it wasn't God's fault. God pleaded with them and pleaded with them and pleaded with them. But they would not. All right, let's turn to Acts for just a little bit and pick up this same thought. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 on the Pentecostal sermon. Peter is preaching. This vast crowd of Jews gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. And remember, this is just 50 days after the crucifixion. Acts chapter 2. And here's the same response. Total neglect. Verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Why? They neglected to understand that he was the promised Messiah. He proved it for three years, but they spurned him and they neglected, even as those who were invited to the wedding feast. All right, let's go over a little further, still in the book of Acts. Let's come on over to chapter 25, when Paul has now come on the scene. Acts 25. 24. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the 25 on my page. In chapter 24. Chapter 24. Dropping in at verse 24. Acts 24, verse 24. <coughs> All got it? Acts 24, verse 24. And Paul, of course, is now uh, being accused and is being supposedly brought to trial. And, of course, he's going to plead Rome instead. But here's the setting. He's been under arrest. And uh, now verse 24 of Acts 24. After certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, you all know this. I know you do. But I want to give you another thought on it. Verse 25, And as he reasoned, Felix, this, this governor, or whatever his title may have been, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. And he hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul that he might loose him. What's he doing? Neglecting. He's putting it off to his own doom. And so, oh, the constant reminder in Scripture is don't put it off. Don't put it off because the scripture says now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next year, but now. All right, now then let's come back to Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, we'll go on a little further in the verse now. So how shall we escape? How are we going to miss the doom of the lost if we neglect 
or spurn or postpone so great a salvation. Now listen, I'm afraid the average well-intentioned church member doesn't realize what a great salvation has been offered to the human race. It's beyond human understanding. It's just totally, totally beyond us. All right, now I'm going to bring you back again to Romans. Romans chapter 1, a verse that most of you probably know from memory. This great salvation, Romans 1, 16. Romans 1, 16. How can we escape? How can the human race escape if they neglect? if they spurn, if they postpone, or treat lightly so great a salvation. Romans 1.16, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that repents and is baptized. Your Bible doesn't say that, and neither does mine. Or anything else you can put in there. It doesn't say that. This great salvation has now become accessible to everyone that believes it. Faith. Trusting it. See? To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. All right. So great a salvation. Well, let's go look at Philippians. Philippians. I'm going to wear your Bibles out today. I uh, thought of that as I was even preparing last night that we're going to do a lot of page turning today. Come back with me to Philippians chapter 2. And the whole idea that we want to keep on our mind for at least this program and maybe on into the next one is this great salvation. This great salvation. Verse 5 of Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 5. Verses that we use periodically. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who... God the Son, as we saw in Hebrews 1, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was God. He was the creator, remember, of everything. But even though he was the creator God, he made himself. Someone else didn't do it. He wasn't forced into it. But he of his own volition, by virtue of his own grace, he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant. Now, the other word for servant in the Greek is a bond slave, the lowest level in the human economy, made himself in the form of a bond slave, made in the likeness of of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. See that constant lowering of himself? And he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now again, our human intellect cannot comprehend all this. It's just beyond us. We cannot put together and get a full understanding of all that was in the mind of God when he pre-programmed that horrible death of crucifixion. Because, see, when you go back into the time of Moses when the serpents were running rampant through Israel, what did Moses put up in the midst of the camp? Well, the brazen serpent. 
And the whole idea was that if they would look up to that brazen serpent, they would be healed of their snake bites. Well, then you come along into John's Gospel, and what does John say? That the Son of Man had to be what? Lifted up. He had to be lifted up in order to again fulfill the type of the brazen serpent. And so it had to be the death by crucifixion. No other death would have lifted him up. He had to be the, the cursed one. Because again, you go back into the Old Testament economy when there was a no good son and he was incorrigible and nobody could do anything with him. What had to happen? Well, they had to put him to death, but after they had stoned him, what did they do with his body? Hung it on a pole. And again, what was the whole picture? Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And so those were all prototypes of what Christ would fulfill in that horrible death by crucifixion. But, you see, in God's sovereign way of thinking, it had to be. Nothing else would have worked. And see, we can't comprehend that. I can't. I don't think anybody can. In the same way, the soul that sinneth. In fact, come back with me to Genesis. We've got to see this with our own eyes once in a while. It makes a better impact, I think. Come back to Genesis. Chapter 2, verse 17. Right at the beginning of the human experience, Yes, before Eve is even on the scene. And so Adam had to teach this little piece of theology to his wife Eve at some later point, because Adam is alone when this is happening. And now look at it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. The Lord is instructing him now of his habitation in the Garden of Eden. But the Lord says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. But now look at the next statement. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt, what? Surely die. Why? Because the day he would eat, he would be a disobedient person. And disobedience is sin and sin and death go together. And so this is the whole purpose then of Christ having to die is to overcome the death that was precipitated by sin. Now you see, you start putting all that together and it gets mind-boggling. Is there any wonder then that the Bible calls it so great a salvation? It is so great that we can never fathom it. And that's why the Lord has been gracious and he lets it take it by faith. There's no way we can finally pass the exam and say, well, Lord, I'm, I'm ready, test me. I ain't got all the answers. No, we never would get there. We'd never fail it. So he's made it real simple. We just come in by faith, believing as much as we can understand and, of course, as a believer, then, we begin to comprehend a little more and more all the time. But listen, this is such a great salvation that no one can understand the total ramifications of it. All right, let's go back and look at a couple more verses. Let's go back and look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. Now, you want to remember that Paul's letters are always directed to you and I as recipients of God's grace, the church age. All the rest of Scripture, as we saw in the last program, were written for our learning. But these are written to us, not just for us, they're written to us. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, my, we can just sink our teeth into it. And we can just say, this is God speaking to me. Even though it's through the apostle's pen, it is still God speaking to you and I. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And now I'd like to start at verse 17. Verse 17. My, this throws a curve at a lot of people, but it's what the book says. It wasn't what Les Feldick says. This is what the book says. Where Paul writes, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to 
preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, in other words, not with some high and fast talking whatever. You know, even Apollos was a great orator, but it took a couple little humble Jewish lay people to teach him the truth. All right, so he doesn't come with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. Listen, at the heart of everything is that work of the cross. Now verse 18. Now remember what I'm still harping on. How great a salvation, and for the most part, mankind is neglecting it, and because they're neglecting it, they're going to never escape their doom. All right, don't lose sight of that. Verse 18 now, 1 Corinthians 1. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. How true. How true. The average person here in the Bible Belt, they do not really feel that it's the cross that makes the difference. All right? But unto us who are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, is the what? The power of God. Now, you've heard me say it on this program over and over. It took more power to save this sinner and you as a sinner than it did to create the universe. Now, you may think that's a play on words, but listen. Who held us chained to our lost estate? Satan did. Satan held every one of us. Who alone could break that? The work of the cross. And so great a salvation. Well, only got a minute left. Let's come on down. Let's just not go any further than these verses right here in 1 Corinthians. Come on down to verse 22. Verse 22. And remember, the whole idea is this great salvation based upon the preaching of the cross. Now verse 22, for the Jews require a sign, and we'll be looking at that in a future program in Hebrews chapter 2. Oh, they were always saying, show us a sign, and Christ did with wonders and miracles and signs. But the Greeks, on the other hand, they didn't care about signs and miracles. All they wanted was what? Wisdom. Wisdom. But for us, God satisfies both sides of the coin. He gives us the power of God. Thank you for he watching the Through the Bible God. with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.